Climate change is coming and it raises an unsettling question. If you had to move to protect your family, where would you go? It's a scary thought, but one we might need to consider. Let's explore some options and uncover the surprising factor that matters most. Now, you might have heard all the news stories of New Zealand as a climate refuge, but let's say you're not a tech billionaire with money to burn on a far-flung refuge, or you don't enjoy insanely long flights. So in that case, where else could you go? I've done some digging and I'm going to share what I found. And by the end, I'll reveal the one factor that I think matters more than any other when making this decision. Now, I call this a thought experiment, but as I researched, I realized this is no longer hypothetical. Climate displacement is already a harsh reality for millions. Over 30 million people are already displaced each year by extreme weather events. And this is just the beginning. Look at this study. Climate and environmental risks, once scattered in the top 10, now dominate the top seven. And this includes things like forced migration and the breakdown of social cohesion, the knock-on effects of a changing climate. So where do we begin? Well, I personally can't stand heat, so temperature was my starting point. I want to live somewhere comfortable. And I discovered two key concepts you need to know about. First, the human climate niche. A 2020 study found that for millennia, a huge percentage of humans have lived within a surprisingly narrow temperature band. It seems we're a bit like Goldilocks. We like it not too hot, not too cold, but just right, with average temperatures between 11 and 15 degrees Celsius. Although, unlike Goldilocks, we aren't trespassing onto someone else's property and eating their porridge and then having the audacity to complain about it. That study shows that over the coming 50 years, as the human climate niche moves, between one to three billion people will now be left outside the climate conditions that have served them so well over thousands of years. You can see how the red and orange areas are becoming less suitable, while the green areas are shifting into that Goldilocks zone. What this means is that in, say, southern Europe or parts of the US, many of those people may find themselves looking northwards in the coming decades, while here in the UK, we are starting to shift into that niche. This graphic from a 2022 nature study shows which populations will be the most affected. Do you see any surprises there? The difference between the light blue and the dark blue bars is whether the Earth's average temperature increases by 1.5 or 2.5 degrees Celsius. The light blue bars show the impact of that 1.5 degrees Celsius increase. But it's not the whole story. There's another crucial concept, wet bulb temperature. Wet bulb temperature measures the combined effect of heat and humidity. It's a more accurate measure of how hot it feels. When it gets too high, our bodies can't cool down, leading to heat stroke and even death. And here's why it matters. Climate change is actually increasing the frequency of these wet bulb events, where heat and humidity reach dangerously high levels. A wet bulb temperature of 35 degrees Celsius is often cited as the limit of human tolerance. However, more recent studies have suggested it's even lower, around 30 to 31 degrees Celsius. At that point, our bodies lose the ability to regulate temperature. Without air conditioning or some way to cool down, it could only take just a few hours for those conditions to become deadly. And that isn't some hypothetical scenario. You can see here footage of a news presenter in India fainting live on air, seemingly due to a wet bulb event. As you'll note, the effects can be quite distressing. So this map shows the projected frequency of wet bulb events. Let's just say Japan is off my list, which I didn't expect. The Persian Gulf, South Asia, and parts of India also stand out. So temperature is one piece of the puzzle, but what about disease? Moving from temperature to disease, it sort of seems like a bit of a jump, but they're actually closely connected. As our climate changes, disease patterns will shift too. For example, many diseases are spread by vectors such as mosquitoes, and different mosquito species have different temperature preferences. But overall, warmer temperatures create more favorable conditions for these disease-carrying insects. Take malaria, for example. This map shows where it could spread. Interestingly, parts of the US are now in the red zone. A Stanford study found a mixed bag when it came to these other mosquito-borne diseases. Now, the good news is, in warmer areas, the risk might actually decrease for some. But the bad news is in colder areas, the risk for all these diseases is likely to increase. But then the more I dug, the more I realized this was more complex than I initially thought. And that's because this isn't just about vector-borne diseases, but also about waterborne diseases that may have a more direct link to climate change.
because we can expect increased flooding, potentially exacerbating outbreaks of diseases like typhoid and cholera. This infographic illustrates the range of diseases that could increase because of different climate change effects. And one study indicates that a staggering 58% of human diseases will be exacerbated by climate change. And because it's not just mosquitoes or vector-based diseases, it becomes really difficult to map all of this onto a single comprehensive map. Okay, so all this science helps me rule out certain places to some extent, but I was still struggling to figure out, well, what locations could I definitively rule in? Were there any other concepts or rules of thumb out there that could help me? I came across a couple that stood out. The first was the University of Notre Dame's Global Adaptation Index, or ND-GAIN for short. Now, this index ranks countries on their ability to adapt to the impacts of climate change, whatever those impacts may be. It combines various factors like economic, developmental, social vulnerability, and the institutional readiness to assess a country's overall resilience. In short, it assesses whether a country's government, institutions, and policies are mature enough to signal that it's prepared and able to deal with whatever comes its way. And that could be things like investing in renewable energy, developing drought-resistant crops, implementing early warning systems for extreme weather events, and so on. And if you visit their webpage, you can scroll down to see where your country ranks. And you might be surprised. Secondly, another study, this one from the UK, took the outputs of that ND gain index and refined them further. And they created a short list of countries. And they identified five geographical locations with what they termed favorable starting conditions. And these are things like stable geography, access to resources, strong governance, which may allow these countries to be less affected by the worst impacts of climate change. These five countries are New Zealand, of course, we already know about that one, Iceland, Australia, which surprised me a bit, but maybe it refers to very specific parts, hopefully not the bits with the giant spiders, Ireland, and to some extent, the UK as well. It seems these are sometimes referred to online as lifeboat countries, though that term can be a bit misleading and it's used to mean a few different things. Okay, time to admit something. I gave up at this point. That's because each thread I pulled at seemed to introduce even more complexity and uncertainty. I could have looked at water availability, agricultural suitability, the list goes on. I was really beginning to drown in data, figuratively, of course, for now. After all, even if I found all these data points and overlaid them, relying model upon model, assumption upon assumption, how much certainty could I really bring to those projections? And by the way, at this point, I also have to acknowledge the elephant in the room. What is clear from these maps is that it's the poorest countries that will be hit the hardest. So this is a little bit of a first world thought experiment, a privilege afforded to those living in the West. But for many in those really badly affected areas, enforced climate migration may be the only thing on the cards. For example, in low-lying coastal areas or islands that will be submerged. And sadly, many may not even have the resources to even begin to consider this thought experiment, let alone act on it. So I took a deep breath and I tried to come back to the central question. Given all this, where should you move? And what's the single most important criteria you should consider? Well, as always in Future Flect, I'll encourage you to think independently and form your own point of view. I'm not an expert by any means, but for what it's worth, Here's my take. When I started this research, I was convinced I would find scientific sweet spots, perfect locations backed by data and models. But instead, I discovered something unexpected. The answer lies more in people than in patterns. That's why I found that ND gain index so compelling. It measures how well communities and governments respond to challenges. Because ultimately, your quality of life will depend more on having strong institutions and supportive neighbors than finding the perfect temperature zone. I guess I initially set out to find the Goldilocks zone in terms of climate, but now what I'm saying is think about who Goldilocks will have around her. Do those people help or hinder her quality of life and likelihood of adaptation? Are they helpful, resourceful, and kind? Or are they the type to eat all the porridge and then blame the bears? These are the sorts of questions that keep me up at night. Well, that and the TikTok algorithm. The truth is there's no one size fits all answer. It depends on your personal risk tolerance, your values, and practical considerations like passport strength or access to labor markets. But there is a best approach. Look beyond the data to the people. Consider how your potential future community approaches challenges and supports each other. And if you're staying put, think about how you can strengthen your own community's resilience. We'll all need to get by with a little help from our friends. Also, if this matters to you, 
Start asking more of your government, especially if they don't rank as high on that ND gain index as you think they should. I hope you found this helpful. Catch you next time. And remember, stay curious to stay ahead.